right, welcome back to the Notary Podcast with Daniel C. Lewis. And today I have a very, very special guest, Jocelyn Waters. I And I, I'm going to say that she's a very special guest because I, and I, Jocelyn doesn't even know this, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to start this podcast is for people just like Jocelyn. If you're not familiar with Jocelyn, Jocelyn is a notary in uh, where you're at, St. George, Utah. Uh, she's actually been a notary in a, you started in California, correct, Jocelyn? No, I actually started in Florida. Oh, so you started in Florida. Mm-hmm. And then where did you go from, from there? Then I moved back to Utah. Then I moved to California. Then I moved back to Utah. So you had three commissions. Yeah. In yep. three different states. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, yeah, Jocelyn is a very special note. And uh, what I was saying was, I wanted Jocelyn on here. This is she's one of the reasons why I wanted to start this podcast because so many notaries are have very similar stories to Jocelyn. Jocelyn is a very, very successful entrepreneur. Not only just a notary, but a very successful entrepreneur. She, uh, she uh, I watched just this morning. Watched another when I started these podcasts. I watch other people's podcasts, and a lot of notaries start off. They do podcasts to try to position themselves to be uh, an expert. And what I, one that I watched this morning, this notary in Jocelyn, you'd be interested. In, she she does classes, and she had somebody, one of her students, on and said she just I just taught her how to do notary signing agent work. She's now going to spend the next fifteen minutes telling you to take my class because she just did her first assignment. This podcast is different because I wanted to talk to notaries like Jocelyn. Jocelyn is a successful entrepreneur. Um, When she started her business, I believe she was a single mom. She worked through that. And she's working in getting passive income, diversifying her business. She's one of the most successful notaries in the country. And she's right there in uh, 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 St. George, Utah. So I'm so happy to have her on. And we're going to talk about all of that. Jocelyn, just tell us, first of all, how did you become a notary? How did What started you in the notary field? Well, back in 2005, I was working for the property appraiser's office in Jacksonville, Florida, aka the assessor's office, but they call it the property appraiser's office there. And there was a guy that did it on the side and he told me about it. And I said, oh, that sounds really intriguing. Can you help me get started So he told me what to do. He did come with me to my first one, which was helpful. And then I was just pretty much on my own after that. But that's how I got started. And that's uh, when you say he told you what to do. That's like a notary signing agent doing it for real estate agents, right? A real estate assignment. And that was in Jacksonville, Florida. Then you went to, you said you went back to Utah? Mm Mm-hmm. And you got your commission there. And did you start doing notary signing agent work there? Yeah, I did start doing it here for a little bit. I was here for about a year, a year and a half, maybe. And then ended up moving to California with my now ex-husband. Long story there. but And then actually the day that I got did- my commission there in California, because it, it takes a long time there, um, was actually the day that I left California. So I didn't actually do anything. I put all that effort in and then my ex, my you know, ex-husband and I ended up splitting up um, at the time. Obviously he wasn't my ex-husband, but that's, that's what those moves were attributed to. So you had a notary commission in Florida, Utah, California, now Utah again, correct? Yeah. Very good. What, what, what are some of the, obstacles because you said you had an ex-husband and you you were a single mom then for a while too right yes really up until I mean I just got married remarried a year and a half ago so I was single that entire time oh wow, wow. What are little, some of the obstacles? Um, oh go ahead oh go ahead go ahead yeah I was just saying the kids were little um I during that time that I moved back to California my ex and I my now ex, we had decided to have another baby and it just didn't work out. So, um, yeah, the kids were really young. My daughter, when I, when I was just completely 
moved back to Utah. My son was about seven months old and my daughter was not quite six. And so, yeah, just had to do that the whole time as a single mom with little kids. Well, and you were running your notary entrepreneur business then mm -hmm. too, right? Yeah. Wow. What? How, how would you say you approach obstacles as a single mom uh, working your business, being an entrepreneur, how did you approach obstacles that you've had? Because I get a lot of uh, single parents, mother and father, uh, who says, hey, I, I have what they call the disease, the kids. Um, but how did you, how, how do you approach obstacles like that? Just take it one day at a time. I remember thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do this and kind of a panic moment for a little bit. Um, but you know, yeah, I just took it one day at a time and managed to do it. Yeah, yeah. And do you, if, when I look at your overall career, which should be a model for a lot of notaries coming into the, to the business, you really, really work your business, not as a mompreneur, uh, you, you work it and you diversify your business. Tell us about what, diversifying your business. What what led to some of the things that you've done that were successful? Like you're a property owner, you're a financial advisor. You, you, how did you become so successful? What what tips can you give us to become successful? What tips? I love business, and I think that's probably the number one thing. I just enjoy the challenge of it. And I I kind of can't stop. I told my accountant the other day, I said, I'm just gonna buy only three more properties and then I'm just I'm gonna be done. And he's like, Yeah, okay. I'll believe it when I see it. He said, You're gonna get bored if you do that. And so I'm like, well, maybe you know me better than I know myself. But uh, I just basically I worked hard with an notary business and I took the money. And I would save it and then I would buy a property and then leverage that and then buy another one and keep on going. And I love helping other people improve their financial situation. I always have. I Years ago, I used to ask my friends if I could be their financial planner just for free. And I was just like, I know I can help you, especially that when I would see people really struggling. And I, so I... I have been in the industry for a little bit with some other companies, but nothing really fit uh, until last year. And then the company that I've been with is the perfect fit for me. So that's been going really well. And it works really well with being a notary because I get clients, like I'll go notarize for someone and then see, oh, they don't have a trust. And we help people get their trust done at a really great price. And then I, and I get a little kickback on that, a couple hundred bucks. Which really, if you think about it, and it's really easy, all you have to do is, because a lot of people already know that they should have a trust. If they don't, I educate them on why they should. And most people want to, because they do care about what happens to their assets when they're gone. They don't want that just left up to the government. And it's pretty easy because they don't ever have to leave their house. They can do it over Zoom. The price is really good. And all I have to do is just do a little bit of education and then I set them up an appointment on the attorney's calendar, and then I get paid. It's it's pretty awesome. But then I'll do their financial plan as well. And so they all, they all work well together because I get clients from my real estate properties and then vice versa. And it all just kind of flows together in a circle because they're all related. I, I like what you a lot of things you said there. Uh, and we, I'm just going to peel it back a little bit. So your notary business, you're you're working as a notary, and you said something about something that a lot of people uh, they hear but they don't understand. You said with my notary business, I put a little bit of money away and then I invested. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Putting money away? Could you give any tips? Because there's a lot of notaries that's living check to check to check. How, what what tips can you give them to say? Because right now, just think of this for, for the viewers. She started a notary signing agent business. She was a notary signing agent business owner. And she started putting money away. From what I've heard her say just now, 
And now she owns property. She helps people with their financial planning. She has diversified her business and she is a thriving, successful entrepreneur. So if we can peel this back, because a lot of people are at that point where they're just working and they are, um, they're just working check to check. How, how would you, what, what would you tell someone who said, I need to save money, but I just don't know the mechanics of it. What would you tell that person? You know, it's, it's really just simply a mindset thing, right? Because when I first got divorced, I, and I, I had previously before I moved to California, I was working for the county assessor's office, but that was back during 2009. Well, it's 2000, the beginning of 2009 when I moved back to Utah. And I'm sure you remember the whole world was crumbling, right? It was just like job losses everywhere. You had Lehman Brothers, all these big companies. It was just bad news everywhere. No one was hiring. And so I couldn't get my job back with the county. I ended up getting a job, believe it or not. At this point, I had not been able to make my notary career a full-time career. It was just very much a very part-time thing. I didn't really ever know that it would become a full-time thing. And But I kept with it, even though I just maybe only do one here and one there. But I ended up getting a job about the only one I could find in auto parts, believe it or not. Totally unrelated, but hey, I just was like, I've just got to get a job. And I took a big pay cut. I mean, I was making $1,000 less than I was working for the county. And I just had to cut back on everything. But I still had money left over at the month. And if you can take a $1,000 a month pay cut and still have money left over, I mean, that just, that just says that it, the problem is that most, the majority of people do live paycheck to paycheck. And I think it's just simply because we live in a world where people are only thinking about today. They're not even thinking about tomorrow, let alone next week, next month, next year, or anything beyond that. Right. And I knew that my situation was temporary, but I was very careful with everything. I literally just did not spend money unless I absolutely had to. Not only that, but at that time I had previously bought two properties that this terrible realtor I had before the subprime market crashed in 2007 mm -hmm. convinced me to buy. And I ended up having to supplement those. I was actually having to pay $500 a month between the two because I wasn't even getting enough rent to cover the mortgage. Um, but I still was able to make it happen and I still had money left over. Yeah, I mean, I literally just like the furniture I bought, I just, I bought used furniture, right? Or I was just really careful when I, I didn't go out to eat. I was careful about the food I bought. Um, yeah, I just think people aren't careful. I mean, you'll find that like as a financial plan, you'll find that people are, they're struggling. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They have no savings, they have a bunch of credit card debt, but then they're getting Uber Eats, you know, and all these different things. I mean, I just don't think there are that many people that have to live paycheck to paycheck. It's just a mindset and a choice. Well, let me ask you this, because this, I, I, I totally agree that you've just given us so much great information about it being a mindset. I totally get that being a mindset. How important is it to, to uh, be have a strategic financial plan for entrepreneurs? How how important is it for an entrepreneur to have a strategic financial plan and just uh, be aware of their expenses versus their assets? Well, I look at it this way: if you don't have a plan, you have no idea what to aim for. So if you if you've heard the analogy of the if you took the best archer in the world right you put a blindfold on him you spin around a bunch of times and then say okay you know shoot for the target he has no clue where it's at what are the chances he's going to hit it like on pretty much zero right very solo and so the same thing if you have no plan you're not where are you you don't even know where you're you don't know what to aim for if you don't know what to aim for you're pretty much doomed to fail well i i what if you are a person like me? I uh, I grew up in a very rural area in South Carolina, and my grandparents never talked to a financial advisor or anybody to help them uh, with their money unless it was somebody at their employer's office setting up their pension. And now pensions are gone away. 
Um, my parents never talked to anybody, financial planner. And when I talked to people, they said, well, I never talked to a financial planner. What advice would you give a person that's never set up a financial plan for themselves outside of, okay, I'm going to pay my rent, my mortgage this month or whatever, outside of that. They've never done anything outside of that. What advice would you give them to, as far as you being a financial planner yourself? The, the biggest piece of advice that I could give is don't think of it as I don't have enough to warrant a financial planner, because that's what most people get in their heads and think, well, I'm not sort of, I'm not worthy. You're not going to want to spend the time with me because I'm just not, I'm not who you're looking for. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough, that kind of mentality, which to be honest is true for a lot of financial planners. They won't work and advisors. They won't work with you unless you do have a certain amount. Um, but that's, that's definitely not everyone. And so I would find one that, it doesn't matter to them how much you have or don't have. They just want to help you improve from where you're going now to the next step, to the next step and beyond. Because your financial journey should be a journey that lasts your whole life. It's not a one and done. We meet for a couple months and it's over. It just keeps on going and going. Well, with <laughs> let me ask you this, because I had a person that uh, one of my good friends of mine, we talk about financial planning sometimes and and she's uh, she's married uh, to actually someone who does financial planning. And I asked her about her retirement and she says, my spouse is gonna take care of all that. And I was thinking, what if your spouse has a stroke or a heart attack or dies tomorrow? I don't know, he's taking care of that. What would you tell someone who says, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that to someone else"? What would you tell an entrepreneur that's supposed to be an entrepreneur in their own business, but doesn't know their expenses and say, "Oh, somebody else is gonna take care of that"? My guess is, if you do that, you're probably not wanting to pay attention to those details in your own business, which means your business will struggle you'll think that it's okay to go and do a $30 buyer package, you know, that's 25 miles away because, well, it's better yeah. than nothing and not understand that you're losing money by doing that. Yeah. 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 Any, any pearls of wisdom for someone who, who is that I, and I, cause I, I see a lot of people, there's a lot, see a lot of single mothers seeing you know, fathers but then they say well i want to be more financially fit but i don't have people in my group around me that's financially fit i don't have a, a supportive spouse or anything like that how what, how would you give them advice what, what advice would you give to them that's probably the most difficult thing is not having a supportive spouse and I'm not even sure if I have the right answer for that. If they're literally trying to drag you down all the time and, and they don't want you to go anywhere, I mean, that's a pretty serious problem. Um, if it were me, I would still just do my own thing. And this might sound bad, but what else do you do? I just probably wouldn't let them know because I can't be drugged down to the point where it's going to harm me in the future. You know, it's kind of one of those things like either you get on board or the ship's going to sail without you. I mean, yeah, I mean, it sounds bad, but what else do you do? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can try, I, I, I to, totally you can try to get, yeah, I mean, you can try to get to the, the bottom, right? Because people have so many psychological reasons. When it comes to money, it's, people have so many emotional ties to it, right? All these different yeah, things. Yeah. Like money is not just money. It's so many feelings attached to it i mean you could try to figure out what's going on inside them that they're trying to keep you down right and if that doesn't work um yeah i i still would keep planning well how important is it for notaries uh especially i see notaries a lot of time and one of the mistakes i see that i in my opinion they make is 
their one dimensional thinking of I'm only going to do notary signing engine work or I'm only going to do remote online notary work. How important is it to really diversify and add some passive income into their planning, their business planning? I think it's extremely important because we work in probably the most cyclical industry there is. I can't think of anything that's more cyclical than the mortgage industry. Sometimes it's insane. You can barely keep up like it was in 19, especially 20 and 21. And then sometimes it's really slow, like it's been the past couple of years. And if you don't have some passive income, you're probably going to be freaking out. And that's not going to help anything. You'll probably have to go get a job or you'll be tempted to take really low ball offers, which we've seen over the last few years, which has just driven down what these signing companies are offer because all these desperate notaries are willing to go and you know do signings for almost nothing. But if you have other income, then you don't feel desperate to take those. Yeah. What what type of examples of passive incomes can notaries get into that get into that mindset that you said of saving a little bit and then what 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 type of what are examples of some passive incomes they can get involved in? Well, I really like for down the road. I like IULs um, and indexed universal life insurance policies. Um, that's not going to be a quick income thing but for later on mm -hmm. then they can be a really useful tool for investors as well if you know how to use them properly and use infinity banking and that kind of thing but that's a whole different podcast um annuities are great too again for down the road especially if you have 401ks from previous jobs those are great to roll those over into to annuities um, and i also really like real estate always a good one which can create more immediate income for you but obviously there is a bigger buy-in to that than the others unless you can find and, a partner with you but that can be tricky too yeah that can be tricky too i, I like what you said um because a lot of people they're coming from corporate america and then they're trying this entrepreneurship and in corporate america excuse me they probably have some type of savings a 401k or some type of uh, pension type of savings plan, but when they leave corporate America, they don't realize they can take that and move that to something that, in, in, to another financial vehicle that's going to give them more money. Um, how would they find out if they have something like that that they need to move? And would do you recommend them moving it? Yes, I do recommend them moving it because that way they can get it out of the company's name and into their own name. And then they can plan a little bit better. I mean, the problem with, you don't want to leave too many of your eggs in the stock market basket as you get older, because, you know, you might need that, right? And the stock market, it does this and, and who knows. But when you roll it over into an annuity, you can create a guaranteed stream of income so that you know that you will have that for you in retirement. And you won't know that with a 401k or any stock market vehicle. And, and, and just, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you can definitely outspend the money in your 401k or your IRA. That's easy to do because it's not going to, there's only a set amount in there, right? And even though it'll grow, but if you're withdrawing from it every year, more than about 4% or so you probably won't have enough to last through your retirement. Obviously, depending on how how long you live, but you know, people are living longer and longer these days. And and just just for our viewers, because some of our viewers might not even know what an annuity is. And I, I and for for years, I didn't know what an annuity. I've heard the, the word annuity, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Can you explain what an annuity is to our viewers? Yeah. So actually, pensions are annuities that's it's just a different word for it that annuity is basically a personal pension where you do need a lump sum usually at least ten thousand dollars and then it can and then you can keep contributing to it the more the better right um, and then it will spit out money depending on there are so many different ways to design them but it will spit out money for you in retirement so especially if you have a 401k that's a great use of that is rolling it over into an annuity to create that guaranteed stream of income. Okay. 
Is is it important for, for the person that's just coming into the notary signing agent business or the notary entrepreneur, or even a person that's been seasoned, is it important for them to have an exit strategy in your opinion? From the notary, from their notary business? Yes. Have an exit strategy like for retirement, so to speak, like if they decide, hey, one day I might not be able to do this or one day I might want to leave this for my children or my nieces or nephews. Is it do you think that's important to have an exit strategy? Honestly, I don't think it's as important as it is for other types of businesses. You know, if you had like a brick and mortar business or um, something like that, you have a farm or I, I don't know, all these different things that have, there's a lot to them. To me with my notary business, I plan on doing it indefinitely. I don't have an end date, but if you had to exit, no big deal, right? Or you can just simply pause it for a while and come back or you can pass it on. But I don't feel like it's the type of business that really warrants a big exit strategy. Do you? Yeah, I think if you're getting into, because, well, my perspective, I've been doing this full time and since 20, uh, 2003. And this is how, you know, when I started by myself, I'm, I think I started a little differently than a lot of our viewers. They're doing this kind of part time and some time and that type of thing. But I decided to go in full time. Um, in 2003, when mortgages were, interest rates was low and everybody was refinancing their house and buying new houses. So it was a, it was easy way to do it full time. But like you said, after 2008 and things changed, I was already into it, what, five years, four or five years. And I was like, I don't, I'm, I don't think I'm employable at this point because I had my own schedule. Um, so I, I had a business plan, so I had to rewrite my business plan to keep doing it full time. So for me, yeah, I had to have an exit plan because, you know, this is how I pay my mortgage kids. I, you know, I, I was like you at one point. I had kids, then they have a bad habit of wanting to eat every day. So <laughs> I had to figure out, you know, how I can keep doing this and then be a good provider. So, but I like your model. You you are a model of entrepreneurship. You did it and you diversified. You have businesses going. You're financially advising people. Um, and you are you just have a thriving business. I, I like that. So part of my notary business, it was to diversify, uh, just like you following your model. And I think that's a model that a lot of people uh, would need to, follow do, do you have any speaking engagements and are books coming out that people can follow or because i know we did a book before book before which was i thought was pretty good amplify your notary signing agent business right I'll put yeah, a link and, you know, to that as book. I, and as i look on back on that book things are so different right now that's you know unfortunately i feel the things won't really quite apply because the market's so different than when we wrote it yes but but i still think it has a lot of good points to ponder so i think it's still a good book even if it not everything is completely relevant to this exact point in time yeah any speaking engagements you have so that our viewers can catch up with you because i know they would want to how can they get it? Well, I'll put a link in the description on how they can get in contact with you about financial plan. Do you advise uh, people on financial plans, like you said before? Because I think you are with Wealthwave right now, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you, we you, do it over Zoom and we can do it in all 50 states. If I don't have a license for that state, it's usually not a big deal to get licensed in that state. Like I just got one for Ohio and I just had to pay $25. No big deal. But, but yeah, we can do it in all 50 states over Zoom. So you can advise people financially in all 50 states via Zoom. We will definitely put a link in there with, and that's with Wealth Wave. Wow, that's a great name, Wealth Wave. You want to get a, you want to be a part of that wave, Wealth Wave. That's the you, goal. You also, We're trying to spread the knowledge uh and, and so it is like a wave right it's spreading outward very good yeah so i'll put a link in there to how they can get in contact with you 
maybe even your camel, you have a Calendly uh, link where they can uh, talk to you directly via Zoom and you can help them with that. How important is it to talk to someone like you? Because I know I talked to someone like you, a financial advisor years ago, and I just wasn't in the right mindset. How important is it to talk to someone, a financial advisor like yourself as a notary entrepreneur? I mean, I think it's extremely important. Um, sometimes I'll tell, I'll hear people say, well, I, my accountant does my books. Oh, well, that's not the same thing. Your account does your books. Great. No, that's not what thing. we do. It's not at all the same thing, not even close. Um, in fact, I refer people to accountants to let them do their thing and we do ours. Or I hear people, like I said, the most common objection is, well, I just don't really have anything. But what we do is we help you. Let's find out where you're at right now. That's fine. Let's get to the next step and the next step and the next step. But without, I have yet to meet anyone that even knows, honestly, a fraction of what we teach. And I, so I, sometimes I get people that think they know a lot and then they certainly don't know most of what we teach. And, you know, again, if you don't have a plan, you don't know what to aim for. And I would say very, very few people have an actual plan. And if they do, it might just be swirling around in their head, but it's not, that just doesn't amount to much until it's like actually on paper. And we actually have yeah. deadlines that we plan on meeting. If you don't have a goal without a date attached to it, it's just a dream, right? Um, and so mm -hmm. having someone, it's just the same as having a workout partner who's very knowledgeable, let's say that. It would be the difference in you just going to the gym, you have no idea what you're doing, and you're just wandering around and who knows, or going with a trainer who knows what they're doing, who's gonna keep you on schedule and keep you accountable and educate you, that's the difference. Yes, and um, one of the differences that I, because I talked to financial advisors a, a lot. I've talked to some that was not so good and some that are excellent. I think you are an excellent financial advisor because first of all, you practice what you preach. You are a thriving business owner. You practice what you preach. It's, I've talked to so many that don't practice what they, they preach and their finances are in shambles. So I would highly recommend and I'm not getting any money for this. Highly recommend Jocelyn for being a financial advisor, talking to her, uh, letting her chop it up with you about uh, finances and expenses. She's, and as you can see, she's so easy to talk to, very easy to talk to, very easy. Uh, she's uh, some financial advisors make you feel like, oh my God, you're the worst person in the world with money, but she's easy to talk to. So I've known Jocelyn for for years. I'll put a link in on the description below about e how to get in contact with you with the wealth wave. You want to talk to her, definitely uh, get on her calendar as soon as possible. Her calendar fills up pretty quick. I know we tried to have this meeting a couple of times. So you want to get on her calendar really quickly. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for coming on the notary podcast. I hopefully uh, people have gotten a lot out of this. I've gotten a lot of, out of this today. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll have you back on again. That sounds wonderful. I look forward to it, Daniel. All right. Have a good rest of your day. And by the way, Jocelyn, happy Mother's Day. Well, thank you.